Thank you. Uh, so welcome to Delivering Solutions for Enhanced Command and Control, uh, the panel this afternoon. So uh, as I was introduced, I'm George Duchek. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Command and Control, Communications Networks, Cyber, and Business Systems, all really software-intensive systems. So, so let me uh, just frame, frame the uh, problem and, and set the table a bit here with some introductory remarks. Our cyber env uh, environment is a contested environment. Like every other warfighting domain, we operate daily defending this environment globally. Our ability to command and control our forces and work with others in this contested environment will make the difference between mission success and failure. Command and control is effectively about bringing available resources to bear in a timely manner to accomplish the mission, to command the forces, to control the situation. Decades of research and lots of experience uh, leave no doubt that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to command and control. For all missions and circumstances, uh, our C2 approach needs to be both tailorable uh, to the mission and the operation at hand, as well as adaptable to the circumstances. Agility is key to C2. So this presents three critical and interrelated uh, cyber C2 cha challenges. First, we need to design approaches to C2 that work well for defensive cyber operations, DCO. We need to know ourselves, we need to know the adversary. Uh, this means we need some solid situational awareness, or SA. Second, we need to make mission C2 much more agile so it can adapt to circumstances, uh, including that in, of uh, cyber degraded environments. No plan survives uh, first contact. Lastly, we need to understand the link between the cy uh, defensive cyber operations and the ability to exercise overall mission C2. So these three cyber challenges can be viewed through the lens of uh, Boyd's OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. Our ability to operate inside that is faster than an adversary's decision loop means success. It increases our chances of operational success. Our network enables this rapid and adaptable C2. It's central to our success, and the adversary knows this. So that's why our networks are squarely in the crosshairs uh, of the adversary's attack vectors. Uh, the cyber contest environment is complex and quick, nearly instantaneous. For defensive cyber operations, we cannot esca escape the fact that we'll need to delegate some decision making uh, to autonomy and uh, uh, some decision making and autonomy to our systems. From a C2 perspective, we need to think about our systems and our relationship with them differently. We need to consider them non-human intelligent collaborators. We also need to think about the mission OODA loop from a different perspective in order to decide how to adapt our C2 approaches and uh, uh, processes to co cope with the cyber contested environment. We need to ask, given the various levels of degradation, how we should change our allocation of decision rights, how we how our patterns of interaction will change, how our information flows to achieve a balance between our ability to observe, orient, and then decide and act. Finally, we need to adapt our systems to provide the information and tools that are necessary to appre uh, appreciate the cyber situational awareness in a timely manner and its implications for both defensive cyber operations as well as mission C2. Put another way, we need to harmonize this, our C2 of defensive cyber operations with our mission C2. As we learn how to harmonize our domain approaches to C2, we can move from an environment where it's deconfliction to avoid inadvertent contact and conflicts that adversely affect mission uh, impact to one of developing the ability to dynamically adapt and synchronize our actions across multiple domains, air, land, sea, space, and cyber. So we're fortunate today to have with us a very knowledgeable panel of experts who will help us better understand the C2 challenges and suggest ways in which we can enhance our ability to command and control. Today we're going to discuss uh, such topics as how is C2 and cyber differ from traditional C2 that's known to most uh, everyone. What's the impact that cloud will have on the C2 of defensive cyber operations? How will AI in defensive cyber operations change things? Why do we need multi-domain C2? And what capabilities are needed to enable agility in DCO C2? So the way we're gonna run it today is I'm gonna introduce each panel member. They will give a short five to eight minute overview of their thoughts on cyber C2. 
And then once all the, the panel members have had a chance to set the table, we'll begin the discussion. I'll leave a few minutes at the end so we could uh, collectively answer the burning questions that you all have and uh, go from there. So our panelists today have their bios in the online program, so I'm just going to briefly give to you some highlights of their bona fides because it would take another 10 minutes to, uh, to read each one of their bios. But I'll give you uh, the highlights of their bona fides that say what they bring to the, the table. So we're in alphabetical order, and we have, uh, to my right, uh, Dr. Misty Blowers. She's a recognized expert in AI, the 2018 SPIE Career Achievement Award winner, a noted cyber researcher from the world's best uh, C4I and cyber lab, Rome Labs. <laughs> Uh, and she's the author of a, uh, of, of a book, uh, Evolution of Cyber Technologies to 20, uh, 2035, some 17 years in the future, so I think it's a pretty bold undertaking. She brings deep technical expertise to this panel. Next to her is uh, Mr. Terry Carpenter. He's currently the services development exec at DISA and has, a, has had a long career acquiring enterprise technologies, business systems, and C2 systems for DOD. He has private se uh, sector experiences as the CEO of NextGen Data and brings deep acquisition and industry experience to the panel. Uh, next, next to Terry, and I understand a return visitor by popular demand from the lunchtime engagement, uh, is uh, Colonel Paul Kraft. He's currently the Director of Operations uh, at uh, J3 uh, JFHQ Doden, and he is the previous commander of DISA's uh, Global Operations Command, uh, a West Point graduate. Uh, I'm a Naval Academy graduate, so that's why it's good days at the other end of the table. So. <laughs> uh, but he brings tremendous, tremendous and deep operational experience to the panel. And finally, uh, rounding out the panel is Dan Pareto. He's currently the street strategic executive at Google Cloud. He's a frequent lecturer and writer and advisor to McKinsey, served as a political appointee in the previous administration and DOD CIO. Uh, he's been a VP at IBM, AOL, JP Morgan, and brings a wealth of private sector experience to the government, uh, uh, private sector and government experience to the panel. So you can see by the, the panel members that we have technical, acquisition, operational, and industry perspectives. It's a great panel, and I'm going to turn it over to Misty to start with uh, her burning remarks. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you um, for having me here today. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to say a few words about uh, cyber autonomy, and specifically, um, given the dynamics of cyberspace, uh, will it be necessary to allocate some decision rights and autonomy to intelligent agents? Uh, my background, as uh, Dr. Duchak said, is pri primarily in um, AI and autonomy. Um, and we are facing some unique challenges, in my opinion, when it comes to um, C2 and cyber for command and control. Uh, because of the advancements that our adversaries are making in this arena, it is imperative that we also uh, develop cyber autonomous capabilities so that we can be sure to be competitive in a future conflict. But cyber autonomy um, is also necessary because we're rolling out more and more sensor systems. We're able to observe and collect more data than we've ever been able to collect before. And autonomy is really going to extend the reaches of human functionality um, rather than replace the humans, it's going to allow us to do more. But as we move towards more autonomy, keeping the human in the loop to guide or bootstrap the learning process is critical. Um, it's in, important that we ensure that these operators, commanders, and warfighters, who will always have more knowledge um, from multi-source intelligence gathering, um, are able to impart that uh, knowledge into these learning systems. So in the short term, advancements in behavior analytic tools, we need to marry them up with some of these advancements that we've made um, with the more traditional signature-based methods. Uh, machine learning techniques that rely on historical knowledge that help us build uh, models to guide an AI it will be important because they'll help us, um, they'll help that AI learn from the wealth of knowledge that we already have available to us 
but we're really not able to do anything with it because we don't have the um, capacity to, to reason about all that information. For the emerging threats, sometimes you hear of these zero days, um, it's important for us to invest some money into reinforcement learning techniques. Um, the challenge with reinforcement learning becomes in establishing the objective and reward functions that will guide um, and drive these intelligent agents' behavior. In practice, an unconstrained AI is um, optimal, but it needs sufficient modeling and simulation, test and evaluation to appropriately be able to build an appropriate representation of the operational environment and the rules of engagement. Bounded AI, I think, is where we really are today. Um, when there's not sufficient modeling or simulation or intelligence is available about the operational scenario that these agents will be deployed in, in my opinion, it's important for us to be able to bound them. For the past six years, I've studied the model failure points of these AI-based systems. And it's important for us to remember that not AI, all AI is created equal. Um, when it comes to things like adversarial machine learning and uh, data poisoning, it's clear that some of these systems can be compromised quite easily. So um, as we move forward um, into the future, I really hope that we consider more and more test and evaluation of these systems that um, impart these autonomous capabilities. But it is imperative that we do incorporate them into our mode of operation in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Terry. So when I think about the state of application development and software and, and C2, and those two universes kind of come together. I kind of came up with four A's for you to consider. Um, the first one that I've looked at is the agile, right? We're all talking about agile development. We have to become agile, and, and there's so much more to it than just putting some software in place to help us better build software. It's about the people, it's about the processes, it's about the way in which we used to stovepipe different functions. You get the requirements by the pound, you turn the requirements over to a development team, they build it, you hand that over to a test team, they evaluate how well you did, you maybe look at the security of that solution, and you get approval to put that solution on the network. Just by the way that's described, that's a long process, and we don't have that kind of time anymore. So when we look at our legacy systems, we know we have to retool them, and we have to think in an agile way, which means changing the way in which we even interact as a team from the requirements, from the user community, from the developers, from the testers, from the security folks, to the actual operations and productions of the tool. Um, the second A I'm gonna offer you is always on. You know, there's a lot of missions where we can take risk and push software, new software, and push it really fast into new places and, and new kinds of processes, but when you think about the mission of C2, it just has to always be on and, and accurately working. And the third one that kind of goes with that is in today's world, we're moving around. All the people making those decisions on what to do when a situation arises or moving around. And you've heard here today um, by some of my esteemed colleague here how challenging it is to get that information in real time to make those decisions and then act on them. Well, can I wait for the fact that Paul's commuting home tomorrow, tonight? I can't. So we need to be able to share that information in a way that allows them to get it from anywhere. And the last one I'll offer to you is appetite. That's a strange one to offer in a C2 in software development, but I'll tell you there's an appetite that I've never seen before for trying new things to automate, to make it more predictable, and to leverage things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. We can't afford to keep doing it anymore the way we used to do it. And when I look at what the operators, the user community is dealing with and the volumes of data coming out of the sensors, I mean, you all heard Paul talk earlier about turning the network on its side and saying that we built this huge network, but it's a really great sensor tool. I, as a developer, sit here and go, oh my God, you're going to crush me with the amount of data I have to deal with. That's a whole new game when you're talking that kind of size. And people are used to clicking on something and getting a response in 
lightning speed, right? Your phone reacts to you the immediately the second you touch it. When you talk about petabytes of data and the analysis that has to go on, we have to provide tools that are just as responsive. So there's a large appetite to move to automation, move to AI, increase the capabilities, but there's a lot of challenge and risk in the way in which we do that and build those applications for the C2 function that we have to be thinking about. So those are some of the things that are going through my head as I think about how to provide better tools to the user community. Thank you, Terry. Now, uh, back by popular demand, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. So, it, obviously, C2 is near and dear to uh, my heart as the director of operations for uh, network ops, security, and defense for the DoD. Um, but, but I'll say I'll start off with 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 five points. One, it has to be a team sport from a people, process, technology perspective. I don't want to discount the people part of this. We we certainly can with technology be smarter but there's still individuals that have to come up with the right questions. I think I've talked about questions before to get the right answers to make the right decisions from a decision support system perspective, from a people, obviously, you know, uh, process and technology perspective. Teamwork includes working with our industry partners, uh, working with, our, with academia, uh, working with our agencies, command, command services, so I appreciate having a panel like this to, to talk about it from our perspective. I think that's very rich. Um, on, on how to deal with the C2 challenge that we have. Um, second point, so teamwork. Second point is um, from a C2, it's, it's C2ing a major operation, running the networks, maintaining the networks, potentially making sure that it's built and procured properly, stood up or increased properly from a capacity perspective. How it is secured, uh, actively defended, actively uh, secured from a, I'll say, in the simplest of terms, how well it's patched, how fast it is patched, and then from how well, from a C2 perspective, how well is it defended against an active adversary? So we have to consider it from uh, the static defense plan that we do have in place, and also those maneuver forces known as cyber protection teams on how fast they can get on station physically or virtually in order to deal with an ongoing adversarial um, event. And so with that, the third point from a C2 perspective for me is what, what's, what I'm passionate about is, is, is speed. It really has to come down to speed. We always talk about net speed or cyber speed, and a lot of those, you know, I'll say those words, those words fall short. Um, because when an event occurs and how fast an event can occur in, in cyberspace, obviously in seconds, an amount of data that can be taken is how fat, however big your throughput is or however fast our throughput is on how fast data can be removed, moved, or modified within our networks is, is key. So those accesses are, are important that we, we understand where those are. But it's really the speed, the speed at which we can operate the network, the speed at which we can change or maintain the network, the speed at which that we can secure the network, or the speed at which we can actively defend the network and, and therefore make decisions at speed, which certainly will require um, some artificial intelligence in there, some decision support systems in there. So much of the time that computer is at least providing options for when we have to have, uh, I'll say, a DOD level or even commercial decision that has to be made because we hit a certain threshold. And lastly, is we got to make sure that we balance this. We balance this out. That if we, we go too hard on that, we got to keep it secure, we'll have a network that's closed. Uh, the best, that's the best network is the network that's turned off. Uh, and, and we know we can't do that. So we've got to balance the amount of risk tolerance that the organization has, and that is certainly a, a decision that's made um, by the or organizational leaders with how much threat is, uh, is, is there, and then how can we make sure that we're meeting the operational requirements of that organization. Uh, again, all that has to be put into, I'll say, the big C2 box and, and managed properly. And that's, I'll say, that's what I'm passionate about. I know we've got some follow-on questions, so. Pass. Thank you. Thanks. And lastly, Dan. Terrific. Um, first, I want to thank uh, General Wood and Dr. Duchak uh, and my fellow panelists for the opportunity uh, to speak with all of you today. Um, I was excited uh, when I got the invite because uh, this is a complex and compelling topic. Uh, in particular, what always strikes me when you talk about Cyber C2 and cyber situational awareness is a couplefold. First, the volume of data that needs to be dealt with. Um, the time pressure, uh, network speed that you're under to uh, get situational awareness and C2. And the paradox inherent in all of that, that on the one hand, while you are flooded with data, 
you are slow to knowledge uh, because of the overwhelming amount of data. Um, and my context on this topic um, comes from, as Dr. Duchak mentioned, uh, a, a couple of positions. I was at the White House at the tail end of the last administration. I was on NSC, National Security Council staff, for almost three years where we dealt with OPM, election hacking, uh, Sony, you know, nation state, Russia, Iran, China, active campaigns against us. Um, it's also informed by my time at, at DOD, where I was uh, running the DIB CSIA program and as the CTO running um, a multi-stakeholder working group focused on cybermetrics. And interestingly, the connection to Google, I happen to be there now, but goes all the way back from my perspective to 2013 and 2014. I ran the DOD CIO trip out to Silicon Valley. We were meeting with Urs Holzel, who's the senior VP for technical infrastructure for Google. And Google at this time was just starting to open up their cloud capabilities uh, to industry. Um, you know, Google has seven properties with a billion users globally, but they built their infrastructure to serve their own properties. And only after sort of perfecting them did they open up uh, those capabilities uh, to enterprises. And in that meeting, uh, Richard Hale uh, was there, uh, Terry Takai, the DOD CIO, Dave Mihelchik, the DISA CTO, and also the DOE CIO were there. Urs said to us, you guys must be drowning in data. You must have so much data that's on the cutting room floor that you're not getting knowledge out of. Google uh, is here to help. You know, can we provide you an analytic platform um, you know, that you use on, on a usage basis uh, to help you find knowledge and truth in the data you're drowning in. Um, so it's in that context that, that you know, I, I'm before you today, and I want to talk about a couple things just to provide context on both the flood of information challenge and the timeliness challenge, and add to it things like governance and the challenge of sense making. First of all, just to provide context, globally in 2016, there were 3.4 billion internet users, 17 billion traditional networked devices, and only about 6 billion IoT devices. By 2020, there will be 26 billion traditional network devices and 22 billion IoT devices. So the number of devices, hosts, entities, platforms that you're going to be getting information from is going to increase manifold. Um, and in the middle of all that, as the machines put off the data, you're looking at user data, application data, endpoint, and network data. You are looking for needles in haystacks. That is complicated by the fact that in the DOD environment and in any government environment, there are multiple haystack owners. Information from NSA, multiple components, NTOC, IAD, Cyber Command, the MILDEPs themselves, the COCOMs, DISA, DOD CIO, DC3, the Service Damage Assessment Offices, the MILDEPs, the COCOMs, and the Defense Industrial Base. So the challenge of the volume of information is complicated by the fact that you often need to negotiate to get access to see that data. And just as an example of that, I found a recent quote from Dr. Jim Travis at DISA, who was talking about cyber situational awareness at the NetOps solution division, talking about Acropolis and the big data platform. In one application right now, we have 220,000 threat indicators, 105,000 countermeasures are approved for use. This is from 150 different reporting sources with 10,000 active or passive detection signatures and more than a million attributes. That's just a slice of the pie. In terms of time, I wanted to put more sort of reality on that one as well. Adversaries can easily modify malware in under 24 to 36 hours. The dwell time of adversaries in networks is across industry and enterprises, typically between five to seven months dwell time between stages five and seven on the kill chain. So between install, C2, and actions on objectives, you don't see them for a half year. From a sense-making perspective, um, in all that complexity, you're not looking just for single data points as your smoking gun. You're also looking for a collection of evidence and correlations between data points that indicate adversary activity from delivery to execution to persistence, defensive evasion, C2, credential access, privilege execution, lateral movement, and exfiltration. So the problem in many ways 
has an intractable nature to it. Um, and if you look at not the kill chain, but the mirror of the kill chain, which is basically what I call the responder chain, which maps pretty closely to the NIST cybersecurity framework, the job of the defender, and this is not just the cyber defender, but also the IT staff, is to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Now, in the real world, again, from DOD and White House experience, and we often heard this both from the White House cyber advisor and from the president himself, the information you get is slow, and the first information you receive is almost always wrong. Um, and so this is sort of the difficulty of getting ground truth around a cyber incident. I mean, just as an example, on the federal civilian side, there's an incident. It takes, often takes four to six weeks to interrogate assets and figure out what people have just in their hardware and software. It often takes longer to figure out what the protective posture on those assets was and who had access to what systems and data and applications and when. So there's a flood of threat information often. Uh, asset information is hard to come by. And the greatest paucity of information that we tended to find was around interdependencies and impact, the so what of what happened. The problem with that is the interdependencies and the impact are often the most important piece for figuring out how to respond from a strategic perspective and from a business perspective. Um, and so connecting the dots and understanding meaning is slow, security operations often feels behind the curve. And so I think there are four particular opportunities to improve C2 and to improve situational awareness. And we can get into this in more detail when we get into Q&A about cloud and about AI and ML. The first action is to try to reduce the amount of noise to better find signal. And I believe that the amount of noise around cyber indicators right now stems from the significant overhang of legacy IT systems which are heterogeneous and fragmented. That contributes to opacity. It contributes to poor situational awareness. It contributes to lack of real-time hardware, software, asset visibility. It contributes to poor visibility into sort of patch and hygiene and lifecycle management status. Um, it is unlikely in many cases that enterprises, 59% of all enterprises still lack an enterprise-wide encryption strategy. Um, and again, there is often under-leveraged log data network data because of disputes over ownership on who can look at it and when. The second action, if you can reduce the amount of noise to better find the signal, is to ensure timely access to critical data sources. And the key point here is, again, governance. This is less a technical and a technology issue than it is a culture uh, and governance issue. The third action is to better integrate data and conduct strategic analysis on the data. When I ran the DIB CSIA program, there were multiple years of historic data that were just flat out being under leverage. There was a big focus on what's happening right now, this week, this month, but less focus on what trends and sense can we find looking back across a long span of time. And the fourth action, and other folks have mentioned this, is to transform the efficiency and operational effectiveness of cyber and IT human capital. And I add IT there because I think it's important not to just say these are the cyber mission forces, but this is the entire set of human capital that's dealing with IT issues. And critical issues when you come there and start talking about AI and ML come in regarding what's the human machine interface, what do you allow machines to do on their own versus where is there a human in the loop. But those are questions for later, so I look forward to talking more about cloud and looking forward to talking more about AI and ML in the, in the discussion and questions. Great. Thank you, uh, all the panel members, for a very good overview. So let's uh, begin with operations. Okay? Uh, and I'll, I'll address this to Paul. Uh, you could lead, and then uh, the rest of the panel members can uh, chime in as necessary. So how does cyber C2 differ from traditional uh, C2 of mission forces? You mentioned speed uh, is one, one area, and I'm reminded of the fighter pilot mantra that speed is life. It seems to be the same in the mm -hmm. cyber domain as well, but uh, can you uh, elaborate on that? Yes, so there's both similarities and differences between C2 in the cyber domain and in uh, air, land, sea, and space domain. The traditional domains that we talked about, now a fifth domain, the domain of cyber. Um, 
the, I'll say the, the similarities, for, let me go with the similarities before I talk about the, the differences. The similarities are, there are bounds. There are bounds. Uh, I'll say that uh, the, the roads and paths are, are there. There, is, there are edges, there are forces, there are, there are red forces, bad forces, there are good forces, there are gray, you know, I'll say in the middle forces that are out there, just like you would present in land, air, uh, sea, or space. That's, that's, it is very much the same, but the geometry is, is different because in those other four domains, uh, what separate, the primary separation between those four domains and cyber is that cyber is a man-made domain. And it can be changed. So, you know, Pratt Street may change its name, but there's going to be a Pratt Street. This building is sitting here, was sitting here, will sit here tomorrow. But in the cyber domain, we could shut it down and you would not even see a facility there because we routed around it from a, a network perspective. So the environment, from an environment, um, operational environment perspective, as you try to map what the network looks like changes second by second, minute by minute, which is not really how air, land, sea, and space are today. They're much more static. Yes, they do change. I don't want to discount that. They, they do change, but not at the speed at which the network changes from any great perspective. Services are turned on. Services are turned off. Network uh, links are added. Network links are removed. The enemy uh, intrudes or, or there's just congestion. You know, you know this, the same thing can be said about, you know, I'll say my trip up here from Northern Virginia. I turned on an application to get, to get here, which was a map. And on the map, it said where the high speed avenues of approach were, where the low speed avenues of approach were, where the, where the, police, where the police were along the route uh, from a, a perspective of make sure you're helping the police, not that they're in that area, I'm sure is why they're on the app. Um, and we were able to, and I was able to navigate from my home to here because the application found best path. Alternate path actually gave me th two other alternate paths, told me fastest route, told me where the potholes were, told me very similar to the cyber domain, told me where the animals were in the road, told me where the police were in the road and, and any construction in the road, and we were able to manage that. And that, that also was updated minute by minute. I had three network changes in the land domain on my path up here because of congestion, uh, because of accidents, because of whatever the case is going on. That is very similar to, in that particular case, from a land domain perspective, very similar from that perspective. But how you build uh, C2 just in general is it starts with understanding your environment from a situational awareness perspective. It's very similar to what uh, Dan was talking about. It starts with having situational awareness of what you have within your network and obviously that constantly changes, so that's an added challenge for us in this domain, that's, that's one. From having situation awareness, you've gotta turn that what into a so what from a situational understanding perspective. What does that mean? What is the capacity I currently have? How has that changed in the last five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour? Is anyone pressing on that? Are there services that are not working? Or how is the adversary acting in that particular world? From situational, uh, situational understanding, so Situational awareness, situational understanding, and in the end is C2. That feeds, ultimately feeds, what we're talking about today, which is command and control, because I have to have an understanding of what's going on. I have to have the so what of my environment based off the what in my environment, which constantly changes in order for me to properly command and control, run networks, maintain networks, secure networks, or actively defend those networks. So that's really from the operational perspective. Excellent. Any other uh, comments from the panel members? Uh, I, I'd add one more thing that's a real differentiator. Uh, one complexity, uh, which Paul has uh, discussed, um, the, the, and the time factor, which we've discussed as well. Another one, unlike, I think, with conventional forces, you often don't know when you've been attacked or penetrated. There's a latency between a bad, that bad act and knowing to do something about it. You know, you look at the statistics, the Verizon data breach reports, is, you know, reports I think 80 something percent of enterprise penetrations, they find out from a third party it happened. That isn't so likely to happen in the physical world. Somebody goes and blows something up, you pretty much know about it, and there's not this lag time. Yeah, excellent point. So uh, it seems like new technology is going to help advance this area, and one of the hot topics now is, is cloud. How do you see uh, cloud implementation changing 
uh, C2 of uh, cyber capabilities. And I'm going to turn it over to Dan to lead yeah. and the rest of the panel members to follow up. So, so I'd link my comments on cloud to my comment about the challenge of the legacy overhang um, and dealing with legacy systems, heterogeneous systems um, that contribute to the complexity of the data that you're seeing uh, to make sense of the cyber environment. Um, there has been a big push government-wide um, for modernization, enterprise IT rationalization for a very long time. Um, you know, it seems like every administration decides that they want to sort of modernize government. It's nothing new going back a number of administrations. Maybe it's from my perspective in the White House uh, around the time of the OPM breach, but my sense is that there was a real shift around that time which really put a shot across the bow around both IT owners and agency heads that said, you know what? Maybe me trying to roll my own defense and do my modernization myself and do all my IT security projects myself, maybe that's not the best thing for me to do. Maybe it's okay uh, to recognize that on my own island, I'm less likely to be able to stand up to nation states, um, but I'm better off either in a shared services environment, and that's led to things like JRSS, the Joint Regional Security Stacks, or getting to a modernization place through using managed services from cloud service providers. And that, in many ways, I think is a sea change because the discussion around cloud, the discussion around security and modernization, in my view, post-OPM, have all of a sudden collapsed. What was a cost-saving discussion about IT rationalization used to be separate from the modernization discussion, used to be separate from the security discussion. My sense is, now that with the cloud discussion, those have all collapsed into potentially the same objective in the same trajectory. So when you think about cloud, the opportunity is to move to a more modern, secure, consistent, scalable environment without having to make all the upfront investments yourself. That is what is on offer from cloud service providers. And I will, because I work there, talk particularly about Google. So facing all these nation state threats, if you look at all the different components and agencies in DOD, you ask the question, how much money do you have and how much manpower do you have to invest in modernization and security? I bet you if you ask everyone that question, everyone will say the answer to that question is not enough. So if you go to a partner like Google, what's interesting about it is that Google in the last three years alone has put $30 billion into their global networks and into their cloud platform. In the last, uh, you know, over the last number of years, Google has built a proprietary global network that carries 25 to 40% of the world's internet traffic, and DOD and Google are the most targeted entities in the world. The benefit of partnering with the private sector here is that what Google provides from a cloud perspective is what they use. They sort of, it's the old eat your own dog food argument. It's the same cloud that they use to serve YouTube and make sure that you can load a video up in the middle of Africa in less than a tenth of a second. It's the same uh, fabric that they use for Gmail. Uh, it's the same fabric that they use for search. So the cloud that Google uses and the scalability and performance of it is the same that is on offer to government customers. It's secure by design in all layers, and hardware root of trust, proprietary chips that verify sort of operating systems and machines in the network from, from, from startup, uh, a zero trust network that identifies strong authentication, users, machines, and uses hard tokens, end-to-end -to -end encryption, uh, data loss prevention that scans your content, helps you classify it, make sure you're not leaking information. And both in uh, our productivity applications and on Google Cloud Platform security consoles uh, that give you insight uh, into all your cloud offerings. What am I running? What's in my environment? A, a much greater ability to interrogate and know what workloads you are running. The Google network has a 1,000 times the network capacity of the largest DDoS attack ever. We discovered the Spectre uh, and uh, Meltdown vulnerabilities and remediated them without disruption on our cloud environment. So what is on offer here is the ability to leverage what Google has built for itself to modernize uh, the government's and DOD's own assets. And I think that's meaningful, given the volumes that we see every minute. Again, 10 million malicious emails sort of blocked every day. 
you know, hundreds of thousands of web pages scanned for harmful software every day, um, a whole host of things. Would you rather rely on someone who's done that and proves that on a daily basis with their own infrastructure, or would you rather go it alone to try to build those things yourself? So that's what's on offer from cloud, and I know that's a little bit of a commercial, and I apologize, but, but that is, in concept, the pro public-private partnership opportunity here. And Terry. So let me start by saying I agree with Dan on the value proposition that cloud provides. I'm a little less concerned about which cloud or how we do it. I think the cloud needs to be an agnostic infrastructure thing that's underpinning everything we do. More importantly, though, I, I listen to the warfighter. I listen to the folks trying to deal with this new domain. And what I overwhelmingly hear is this volume of data and just moving that volume of data to the cloud. Now, consider where we were with kinetic warfare. It's been a long time. We put a lot of energy into building the policies, the procedures, the con ops. How are we going to the doctrine that supports how we think about fighting? As we move this data to the cloud, it's an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. And the challenge is we need to take the time to get a handle on that data, understand what the data is and what it's really telling us, and tag it associate appropriately so that when we do get to AI and we talk about some of these other more advanced automation techniques, we can actually make heads or tails from it, from it in a meaningful way faster because we took the time to really understand what the data was. So I just don't want us to lose sight on the fact of cloud's good, moving the cloud faster is great, don't go so fast that you don't take the time to clean up the data and figure out what it is you really have. You're going to discover along the way when you're looking at the data. But what you don't want to be doing is discovering all kinds of false positives because you didn't take the time to understand it. And that's just some of the practical realities I have to deal with in building apps to give to the operators who are trying to figure out what's going on. Thank you. Good insight. What I heard is that a good cloud strategy is enabled by a good data strategy. And that drives, uh, my next question, a good AI strategy. So right. uh, what is the role that you see for AI in uh, the evolving uh, defensive uh, cyber operations for C2 uh, DCO? And let's start that with our technical expert, uh, Misty. <laughs> Uh, so one of the things that um, I see in terms of um, distributed communications um, to enable effective command and control in the, of the future is a convergence of artificial intelligence and blockchain architectures. Um, there's extremely novel um, techniques of imparting distributed autonomous capability and, and functionality um, in the commercial sector, which, uh, in my opinion, we don't pay enough attention to it. So, as an example, um, you know, most blockchain architectures they are can creative constructs of peer-to-peer -peer networks, game theoretics, and cryptography. Um, there are some advancements in, in smart contracts, where the smart contracts aren't so much a contract as much as they are in an in artificial intelligence that's enabled through um, something that enables secure communications and um, proof in, in, and verifiability of message trafficking um, through these constructs that uh, allow for a negotiation of autonomy, autonomous distributed systems to um, be enabled through, uh, through blockchain. Um, the constructs um, that we see in things like Monero allow for multiple levels of encryption, even deceptive messaging to kind of throw things off. Um, in untraceable communications through things like the Covery I2P Invisible Internet Project. Um, but when, when you really start to look at um, kind of some of the uh, functionality with the, the AI itself on those end nodes, um, they need to be adaptive to be able to respond to uh, a, a full spectrum of attack types. I mean, you've got disruption, um, destruction, denying um, services, um, deceiving, degrading your systems, and to be able to fight through and be able to um, carry out the mission um, in the presence of these, um, different, these different attack strategies, it's important for these AIs to be able to negotiate and be able to um, realize which functionality is impo most important for the current situation, for the current environment, and for the current um, operational scenario that they're facing. And I think that we can do this and we can do this in a way that is covert and that we are really borrowing some of this functionality 
from the commercial sector. Um, if we don't start doing this, we see um, that it's making in incredible um, progress. Um, when you look at things like cryptocurrencies, the, the driver and the initiative um, of these um, developers is that they want to generate more crypto cryptocurrency, right? They want to generate more money. So they're um, really um, developing some, some hidden gems that we could really leverage across uh, all of these different capabilities that we're talking about here today. Other comments, Terry? Yeah, yeah, I, th I agree with you. And I think I, I love where we're going and pushing the AI boundary, right? Autonomous multi-agent systems out there are acting on behalf. It gets to the ultimate end state definition. And when I think of AI, I think of it in terms of, if that's the definition where we think we can get to, which is awesome, what can I do now, right now today, to keep evolving toward that? So I think of it in terms of, how can I help the operator discover faster, right? So we can apply some common AI techniques that have been proven over and over again, if we can get a handle on the data, to improve the speed with which we discover things so we don't have this huge lag time of trying to sort through the big data. Um, prediction. How can we all help right, people to predict uh, what's going to happen? We see patterns earlier. Uh, and then getting to the automation piece, which I think Dr. Bowers has been talking about. I mean, it's really awesome to be able to have that automation do things, to be able to identify, take a course of action, respond, and do something appropriate that, again, the operator can really look at and say, yep, that's all going the way I planned. I can now direct the mission from a higher level of what I want to do with this adversary who happens to be in our network. Do we want to learn something? Do we want to get rid of them? What do we want to do? Other comments? Yeah, so just a quick comment. I mean, we're, we're kind of scratching at the, concept, the construct here of, a, I'll say, almost a, a C2 strategy for, for cyberspace operations. And we, we're, we're talking about, of a, you know, from the aspect of an ends, ways, and means, how a military strategy is developed. Um, the, in the end, is because where you, it's where you want to start. In the end, we have a secure network where we know where all the data is, and we know that it is secure. Uh, it is actively defended. We know that the routes are up or not up. We know if we need to add capacity or not add capacity from a network uh, SA, uh, situation awareness, situation understanding, and C2 perspective. In order, to, and so we can C2 that environment. That's the end. The the means by which to get there certainly, um, if with artificial intelligence, will help us speed our ability to get there to see see bad things happening, see good things happening, be able to make decisions faster. Because uh, people people being able to decide uh, a, a billion events a day across our network is very hard to do. So we've got to put a computer in there to really help us out to give us the salient points. Uh, and then a way to do that is really is looking at, from a cloud perspective, a way to solve that would be, hey, let's look at the capabilities within the cloud that are out there. You know, as an operator, you know, I, I get concerned when, the, when early on the reason we were going to the cloud was because it was, it was cheaper. And it was an efficiency, uh, pers it was an efficiency perspective. Money does matter. I don't want to discount. I don't want to discount that from a resource constrained perspective, but from an operator perspective, it's about how effective we will be in. And if we are not going to go to this new way of looking at C2, if we going to the cloud, and that way is not more secure, then we're not answer, We're not going to hit the end state that we want. So if the answer for why we want to go to the cloud and the purpose of why any organization would go to the cloud is because that cloud is more secure, is a more secure environment where I can make better decisions and I can see myself better, that is a great end. And therefore, cloud as a way to get there, AI as a means to help improve that are all in line yeah, from I a think strategy that, perspective. Excellent point that cloud's more about, yeah. more than just efficiencies, it's actually improvement in operations. So. Um, Dan, it looks like you have something to say. Yeah. You know, I, I very much agree um, with Misty and Terry's comments on, on AI, and I, I'd like to hammer home one point in particular. I think it's important to always look at AI in the context of the men and women on the front lines and to not treat it separately as some shiny object. Um, because if you treat it separately as a shiny object, you know, you may move too quickly to fully autonomous things. I, I think the thing to focus on more is how do you augment the workforce, um, particularly given that that is the long pole in the tent on all this stuff. 
There is a global shortage of cyber professionals of millions over the next five to 10 years. Just last year alone, there were 200,000 unfilled posi cyber positions in the US and job postings are rising more than 70% a year. So that is a place where you'll often hear from the Hill, we heard it in White House policy circles, hire more people. You will never solve that problem by hiring more people. The only answer is to augment the human element. And this is where AI can really make a difference. As Terry said, sort of, how do you augment analysts? How do you make them better or relieve them of the mundane sifting through reams of information so that they are better at their jobs? And in that context, the AI should not be unleashed independently. It should always be learning from human analysts to always tune the AI and ML models. Similarly, on the responder side, what can you do, for example, on the workforce and workflow automation side to make them better at their jobs? So I think there's so much out there in terms of military use of AI and controversies and all that stuff, but we always need to tether it to the success of the men and women on the front lines. I think from a policy perspective that suggests, and I think rightly so, uh, that our objectives should be human in the loop for a, a significant time going forward. Um, you know, well before we even contemplate purely autonomous action. Thank you. Just a follow-up question then on that is that AI systems are really only as good as their training data. Mm -hmm. And we've seen uh, fairly recently that adversarial learning shows that a small amount of corrupted training data could have huge impacts on the predictive ability of the AI expert system. So how confident are you that the decisions made by an AI system will reflect uh, those that you would expect a reasonable person to make. Yeah, I, I think that is another reason to sort of continually have human in the loop and to sort of upgrade our policies. I think it, it is true. I mean, there's sort of a garbage in, garbage out if the data is flawed. Um, but look, training AI models, you know, is not easy. It takes large volumes of data before you get confidence in it, and it requires appropriate tagging of, of data elements to build the right models. Um, Google in January um, started trying to make AI more readily available to people who didn't possess in-house deep data scientists by giving the ability to sort of auto-tag AI ML sort of point and click. I think this is net flow data. I think this is endpoint data to just help train. So that can create some scale and increase sort of rapidity in terms of training models. But to your point, the more data you have, the better it is tagged, the better your models are. Um, and we're in a period where that has to happen. And, and again, I think it's important to keep people in the loop on ultimate decisions. Misty. One, one, one of the areas that I um, worked on while I was at AFRL was on a human-guided learning process that um, really gets at exactly what you're saying. Um, in my... Um, in my problem, I looked at a industrial control system and I had the luxury that we don't always have in command and control of having uh, a data set, two years worth of data that was actually labeled, um, that gave some indication of the state of health of that particular environment at, at certain times, um, t state of health bad, state of health good. And with that data and with the models that I was able to develop from that, I was able to um, allow the operators to have a targeted machine learning approach. So the operators' um, historical knowledge and how they take that actually allowed them to look at those boundaries. And when you talk about adversarial machine learning, one of the things that the um, adversaries are doing with these data, data um, poisoning methodologies is really getting at those boundary layers between what's anomalous and what's normal. So if you have some human oversight, once those models have been established and those threshold bounds have been, um, um, you know, kind of um, figured out, uh, you can allow the operators to adjust the sensitivity around those different areas of, of interest so that they can focus in on high uh, events of high interest or maybe events that allow them more actionable knowledge that they can actually um, do something about and allow some of the um, lower priority events to be, um, to be uh, maybe a lower priority for them or maybe a different type of alert. Um, but in doing that, you can allow for a, a great amount of data to be processed in a very short amount of time 
and give those operators something that they can use and not have them just inundated with alerts, which is one of the problems that you're seeing today with a lot of these machine learning systems. They're just inundated with alerts because there's so much noise in that particular environment. Yep. Quick point on, just quick point on that. So, yep. a, a lot has changed what JFHQ Doden is doing. We've talked about our J34 Cyber Fusion um, division within the J3 in, in terms of what we're taking now is all the sensor data off a $24 billion network, infusing that with all the intelligence community information and commercial threat intelligence information and mashing that together and make it a thing. Um, a big part of that is not doing um, or what people could, would confuse as big data analytics. Mm. Um, what some people call big data analytics, what we have found in our, in our work to, to try to do this right is, is people do a lot of data analytics, which is, is not a thing. That's looking at one or two sensors and trying to discern what is happening. It would be like looking at two stock indices and trying to figure out the stock market. Right, so we we know that does not that is actually that actually does not work, and so we tr we attempt we try we're doing our best to fuse all the tier one sensor data, all sensors, hundreds of sensors, with the tier two sensor data, with the tier three sensor data, so thousands of sensors of information that we're taking in, along with fused with with amazing intelligence from our government sources great intelligence uh, from, the, from commercial sources and bringing that together uh, and to, to create a so what, because otherwise it's just a whole lot of, of what, just a lot of noise. And in many cases, if I just took that needle, really from a needle stack, mm -hmm. out and, 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 and we said, hey, this is an alert, and we get about a billion alerts a day with a B, and I looked at it, there's a chance statistically, 96% chance that that is a false positive if I just pulled the needle out. Yeah. And I know that's not how to do big data analytics. Yeah. And so our focus is on the data science of that, of looking at the network in its totality, considering the threat, clearly considering the threat, what the commercial community is seeing before we come up with a decision. And the only way to speed that along, agreed, is with, with AI, with, with uh, some heuristic modeling, with some commercial threat intelligence, or to come up with, with an answer. Because otherwise, we'll spend a lot of time just churning through chunks of data falling on the floor and not be able to make rapid decisions. And we're getting faster and faster and faster. And we're on, we're on a, I'll say, a 24-hour cyber tasking cycle right now. But we'd like to get that, obviously, down into minutes and seconds as we take in all this different data and intelligence and fuse it together with a, with a so what and therefore we need to do this for the Department of Defense. So, hey, okay. great, oh, go ahead. Real quick, the only thing I'll add is, I think all that's right, the one challenge I see over and over again that's starting to pop up is, as you talk, Paul, about moving from the what to the why, the context, right, and looking at behavioral information um, in some other spaces, we're looking at similar problem sets and what we're finding is, the policies and regulations and the laws have not adapted to allow us to put all this data in one place managed by one group. And do we have the authorities to be able to put that data set together to give you the answer you need? So the, the distance between the what you want and what you have is still large, not in necessarily because of technology our ability to implement it, it's the restrictions of implementing it that's sure. really hurting us, I think, to get through that learning phase and give you something that you can really learn and grow from to teach us better what you need. Right. Cause just, just so you know, so we're pulling from about eight, I'm sorry, seven different data lakes, in, mm -hmm. independent, I'll call them data oceans, of where sensor data goes. Right. And so we have to bring that, currently, we have to bring that together manually Right. and figure out what is going on because they're not, there's, there's not a lot of connective tissue between the various data lakes of where we're doing all our big data analytics. So it's data analytics in kind in each of these data lakes as opposed to being able to fuse it together. Yep. Yep. Challenge. The, the Challenge. governance issue is huge. I mean, not only are you pulling from seven different data lakes, the periodicity of it is different. There's sure. compliance data. Sampling there's notes. actually machine data. I mean, mm -hmm. the variety of the data is huge, and, and again, the needles in the haystack will give you millions of false positives or false negatives, billions. 
the reality is, and this is back to what the human analyst does, they find knowledge from correlations across multiple pieces of data as they construct evidence. Think about it as evidence, not just data. And I think you're right, Paul, they're you know, sort of in the hype cycle of big data. Just throw a bunch of stuff into the machine and the truth will come out. That from is one not sensor. true, right? right? One it needs to be multiple data sets, it needs to be broad, it needs to be the kind of strategic take on data that contributes to evidence and the building of confidence in what you're seeing. So, so thank you. Uh, we could have done a whole uh, panel just on AI, it sounds <laughs> like. So, uh, so uh, Terry, in your opening remarks, you mentioned uh, your four A's. Your, uh, I think, was agility, always on, anywhere, and appetite. And we've seen from the discussion so far where we've talked about cloud uh, enabling uh, data, which enables AI, which I think in turn enables this concept of agility. Can you uh, give me some insight on what you think, uh, cap what capabilities are needed to improve the agility uh, for C2? Yeah, I, I think for me it comes down to three things. Um, the drive to meet the ever-changing pace of the needs of the operator are causing us to rethink how we're delivering the capabilities. And agile is one of those proven approaches where we know we can hopefully improve the speed of delivering capability. Those three things really are, it's an opportunity to really re-architect the systems because they're not designed in a way that's very agile. If he comes to me today and says, hey, can you add this to the tool? The legacy tools were written in such a way for the C2 community that it's not an easy build to add that in and the time it takes to go through all those processes. So this is the chance to really retool the architecture of the C2 tool set as we look both at kinetic and the new cyber domain. And then, I think the other piece of that is retool the people. I talked a little bit about the software development lifecycle process and how it was very sequential going through the steps, the pounds of requirements, the document, the uh, application build, the test, the certification process. We've gotta get the folks to understand that your life has now changed if you're, if you're a part of the team that's gonna be building these tools in an agile way. You have to be in with the developers day in and day out. If you're the requirements person or the tester or the IA person, you have to be a part of the development effort every single day. And the third piece of that that I think we really need to look at that can help deliver more is if we can realign the funding to these agile approaches. There's the classic you know, spike in uh, investment dollars that traditionally you see in system build efforts and then the natural fall off in the sustainment, and then we just keep the thing current and just touch it every now and then. You can hear from the cyber operations side, that's not the way they're seeing their mission evolve. There's a lot of learning yet to happen in that space that will teach us all a lot about how we need to fight. And if we can't better align the money to this new way of building the tools to meet the ever-changing demand, we won't be successful. So I think for me, it's those three things. No, it's spot on. I think the mental model of how we deliver uh, software, effectively how we deliver capability to the warfighter, fundamentally has to change in the department. It does. So, so it looked like anybody else? I, I saw a voice almost going through. So, uh, Multi-domain C2. We recognize that the C2 we're talking about for cyber is only you know, one-fifth of the big picture. Uh, we have to integrate kinetics and non-kinetics, so how is DOD thinking about this problem? Let's uh, start with an operator's perspective. Okay. So, so we do have programs of record out there. The, there's a system program of record known as the Global Command and Control System Joint. Uh, and each of the services have their own flavor. It is populated um, for, there is a picture for air, uh, land, and sea. And there's, we, we are working on one for cyber. Uh, that, is a, that is a way, I'm not even going to say it's, it's the way, but that is a way okay. that we would be able to demonstrate, and we have demonstrated it in um, combatant command exercises already, where we can lay out what we see in the air, what we see in land and sea, and then what we see in cyber, red and blue, and it's laid over top uh, on a geographic picture. And so we can see everything that's happening because we're doing a thing called red reporting and blue reporting in cyberspace operations, and we kind of put that on a map. That's, that's the good thing. The, some of the challenges from a multi-domain fight is the cyber domain isn't necessarily about geography. So it is a man-made domain. It, it, you, while you may be getting attacked from country X going into 
country Y, they may actually not be originating in country X. So you can't exactly put a, a pin on a map and say that it's starting to here, therefore let's put a circle around that and let's do something about that. Because that may actually not be where the attack is originating or where the attack is, is going. So we certainly have some challenges in how we properly visualize that and then overlay that against air, land, and sea. But you know, our push right now is to pick best of breed uh, for a, a multi-domain cop. Uh, there's already a program of record out there and we're, we're pushing hard uh, as and offering up, I'll say, GeekJ as a potential solution to get after this, looking at it from a multi-domain perspective, understanding the challenges of being able to display a man-made domain on a, I'll say, geographically on a map. Yeah, yeah so let me piggyback right on top of that, because uh, we're retooling that same platform, right? The, the GCCSJ platform was built as part of that kinetic you know, C2 support tool, and it's the classic legacy system. So client server application, people have their own instances of it, they plug their sensor data in their local instance, and the, the COP is a common operating position uh, you know, that can be viewed anywhere um, within the place where you have that data set. So and then there's this idea of rolling data up as you go higher up into the department organization to get to the people that need to see more strategically versus those that need to see more tactically within a local domain, think geographic. So I think Paul's spot on, as we retool this application to be in the cloud, one of the things we want to do is shift the paradigm a little bit within the application so that capabilities can be turned on and off depending on what the user is and what their, their use case is. Because not everybody's going to want to look at all that data based on the geographic picture. If it's, I'm a cyber operator, I may want to know who is out there on the kinetic side in air, land, and sea, and space in that area where somebody's happening, or better yet, maybe some, somebody who's close to where this event is originating from, right? Not necessarily where it's happening. So there's these context shifts that I think are important to understand, and we're gonna definitely roll them into the current platform by giving them the different view but I think that's more of a stopgap, right? It's what can we learn from the current tool to help us rethink better as we go in the longer term of re redesigning the application from the ground up? Okay, quickly, I've been yeah. told we got to wrap one, up here. One other thing to add on this multi-domain point, um, and it links to one of the comments I made earlier, we have a flood of threat information, a threat of th flood of vulnerability information, but the piece that we often lack is impact. And it's when you think about the impact of cyber compromise, that's where the linkage to the other domains is essential. And there's a 2017 GAO report that said DOD continues to be challenged to move from a compliance focus on cyber to one around operational readiness and operational risk management. And only when you think about operational impact can you easily translate how cyber relates to the operational effectiveness of the other domains. So, thank you. Do we have time for any questions from the audience? Or are we right at the... No, Dr. Dujak, I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> the time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lieutenant General Bob 